Great. So um, I just want to make one random comment. So before I went and got my MBA, I actually was a scientist. And a field experiment back when I was a scientist was running around in the jungle with no hot running water, not setting up mobile experiments. So, um, so it seems a little bit easier now than when I was uh, setting up experiments. But um, so I'm here today to talk to you about um, really sort of thinking about what 2020 is going to look like. And the sort of subtopic of this section is, is setting your, you know, your strategy. And I think one of the keys to setting a strategy is to really understand what the future is going to look like. And I think, honestly, based on the conversation that we've had today, the value in this presentation is not going to be the content, but the, actually the aggregation of the content into some key themes that I think you can take away from today. So very similar to a lot of the other presenters, before you can start believing in the possibility of the future, you probably need to go back in the past. So 2006 is seven years ago. 2020 is seven years from now. Laptops were underselling desktops at that time. Um, mobile devices were not smart yet. Camera phones were around 30 to 50% penetration. There was still a ton of conversation around co connectivity and broadband penetration. And people were having trouble um, accessing content online. Um, E-commerce globally was around 200 billion. It's now around 800, 900 billion, depending on who you ask. And social media back in 2006 was really almost kind of like send to a friend, like forward this email. Um, and there's a reason for that, which is uh, Facebook in 2006 uh, kind of looked like this. And I just re uh, recently announced that it had um, something called a feed, which kind of had some IR, IR uh, in people like, oh, this is a slight invasion of my privacy. Uh, Twitter sent its first tweet in 2006. Um, and uh, I love the fact that there's no bird logo on this. Um, and YouTube was this super cool site with the snackable video content that Google had just acquired. 12.8 million visitors every month, now a billion visitors every month. So I hope that this uh, setting the stage will give you at least or give me at least some free license to sort of uh, wax a poetic about what 2020 is going to look like. So by 2020, um, the Internet of Things will be in full swing. Connected devices will be streaming data from just about everywhere. And there's some categories that you need to consider. Um, we've talked a lot about sort of personal computing devices, whether they be tablets, phones, or desktops. Um, you've got wearable devices like the Nike Fuel Band, your smartwatch, Google Glass. Um, you've got smart appliances and other things that you own, uh, your furnace, your TV, your refrigerator. All of those things will be connected and smart. Um, business infrastructure and inventory will be connected. So on the business side, which I'll talk a little bit about, which we haven't talked a lot about today, there'll be a bunch of connected uh, device and information. And then even the infrastructure around you, so garbage cans, street lamps, the railway infrastructure, all of this will be connected and it's all going to be streaming data. And this is what we mean by big data. Um, we've talked a lot about this today. It took us from sort of the dawn of time, so to speak, until 2003 to accumulate five exabytes of data. An exabyte of data is about a billion gigs. And by 2020, um, this is going to be off the charts, all driven by this Internet of Things and the connected data that's streaming off of that. Um, and let's think about this from a perspective of a, of a baby that's born in 2020. I see some of you are pregnant in here, so let's think about that. Um, in 2020, you can imagine that a baby that's born will have a digital set of data that will include um, its health information, its location information, its social connections. And the thing that kind of worries me is that seventh grade spelling test you fail, that might follow you around too. <laughs> so that's kind of the one source of data that we'll have. The other thing, which I think some of the other presenters have touched on, and you'll see throughout my presentation, the other source of data is really combining data sets to unlock new information. And I think this is really going to be the key to the next seven years in terms of finding those nuggets of value, both for consumers and businesses, and sort of translating that into something that's super useful. So this is an example, a screenshot from Behavio. And it's a very simple example. Essentially, they took location-based information from your mobile phone and tracked it to walking speed, correlated that with the number of text messages the user sent, and were able to pr predict with relative accuracy whether a person was going to get sick or not. So as they slowed down and as they stopped texting, sure enough, they were going to get sick. So you can see how combining two completely <coughs> sort of random pieces of information could actually be somewhat insightful. Um, 
So I've talked about the supply side. So there's stuff streaming from everywhere, and there's also um, ways that you can combine that information to generate insights. But I think what's really interesting are some of the key trends that we've talked about today in terms of demand from both businesses and consumers in 2020. So the first one that I think I'm going to talk about, and I'll probably run through pretty quickly, is real-time analysis and insight. So by 2020, real-time analysis, analysis and insight will be uh, you know, sort of the standard, uh, gold standard for everything that happens. We're touching on that right now. Um, you see apps like Dark Sky, which if you open it up, um, it'll tell you it's going to start raining exactly where you are within the next 10 minutes. Um, people use this at work all the time where I work. We uh, look outside, it looks like it might rain. We open up Dark Sky. We try to figure out whether we can make it to the deli around the corner and back or not before uh, it rains, so whether we need an umbrella. Imagine combining it with another data set, which might stream from the deli in 2020, which is how long is the line at the deli? Can I not only make it there and back without getting wet, but can I make it there and back in time for my next meeting? Cars. Your car is a device that you have that will begin streaming data. It's available now. This company called Carvoyant, uh, you stick something on your car, it tells you everything you ever wanted to know about your car. It tells you the speed, where it's been, um, who's driving it, uh, whether or not there's been certain violations of some parameters that you've set. And even in 2013, you can geofence your car so you can find out if your teenage daughter visited the boyfriend that you don't like. <laughs> Which, frankly, I would not want to be a teenager right now. I had too much fun. So <laughs> what I think is really fascinating about this is that it does begin to indicate that the mobile device that you're, we're thinking about doesn't necessarily have to be uh, a phone, but your car becomes a mobile device for you, becomes a connected mobile device. And what I find extremely fascinating about this is that when you think about your physical assets, so things like your house, your car, there will be a set of data stored in the cloud likely that can be attached to that physical asset. And so you have a digital informational asset that can actually either add value or detract value from your physical assets in the future. Totally different model than the way that we're working today. <coughs> and this also applies to businesses. We haven't talked a lot about businesses today. Uh, thin film is a technology that's available today. It's cheap enough uh, that you stick it on things and you can track uh, you know, that thing that you stick it on kind of to wherever it goes. Um, and again, it's cheap enough today that you can stick it on produce. So you can think about uh, the tw in 2020, this, uh, this sort of technology be uh, ubiquitous. And think about from a, from a business supply chain standpoint. Somebody harvests some produce, they stick the thin film on it, that's tracked all the way through the retailer. And then eventually the thin film probably will talk to your smart uh, refrigerator and tell you when that produce is spoiled. Um, again, it's a little bit of a stretch, but I think if you look back to 2006 to where we are today, maybe not that much of a stretch. The next trend which we've seen a ton about today is actionable and hyperlocal, um, which I'm going to skip over a lot of. We've already seen this Walgreens example, but you can see how once they get the map on there, there's a real-time inventory system. You can sort of see things and buy them immediately from your phone when they're out of stock. You can uh, get push notifications to your phone for specials that you might be interested in. Um, and we already see this uh, today with Shopkick. If you've never tried it, it's pretty cool. It is a, uh, it's an app and a system that a retailer can opt into. And if someone walks into the store, it, uh, it knows you walk into the store and the consumer gets points for walking in the store and doing different things like looking at merchandise, scanning merchandise, buying things. Um, so there's these points called kicks and you get rewards. And so you'll see continually throughout the day today and the rest of my presentation that this value exchange uh, that's generated by data is actually what's going to be driving 2020. And then more on the business side, and I'm using the London airport as really the, the business example here. You can see how this mobile enabled data can really smooth business operations. So London right now is focused on building the airport of the future. And their idea is to minimize security wait times, have the limo drivers know automatically when you walk out the door, baggage <laughs> notifications, food delivery so you don't have to wait in line. And so they're actually building the infrastructure of this now. But the consumer flip side of that is the airport of the future sounds a lot better than the airport of today. Um, another trend that I'll talk briefly about, which I don't think a lot of people have hit on, is, is in 2020, 
all this information will be accessible to almost anyone. And so for those of you that have been in the industry for a while, we saw this in terms of web analytics back in the early 2000s. Anybody do log file analysis? Yeah, it was awful. Um, months and months to do something you could do in Omniture in about 20 minutes. Um, and so we saw a, you know, a democratization of that information. We're going to see the same types of tools, both for businesses and consumers, that use all this information. It makes it super accessible. So this first example I have is Higgy, which is a not super well-known health app. Uh, there's retail store locations. You can track your, you know, your health information in response to an app. Um, it does have some real-time features that changes your health score based on what you're doing. But you can see in the future um, how something like Higgy uh, will adapt to your real-time uh, information and give you an ongoing sort of health score. Um, a lot of people have talked about wearable devices. Fitbit is one of those. Um, and what we'll give you is how well you're sleeping based on you know, sort of how often you roll over and your motion in your sleep. Think about how powerful this is going to be in 2020 when you combine it with what you eat, uh, how stressed you are at work, which is my big thing, and a whole bunch of other information. You'll actually be able to predict, you know, you know, hey, Sue, maybe you should really eat that apple because you know, tonight you're not going to get a really good uh, a sleep out of this. And then think about the mint of 2020. Um, imagine combining Mint data, which if, for those of you that don't use it, it takes all your financial information and aggregates it so it's easier for you to look at. Imagine the Mint in 2020 combined with location. <coughs> I'm walking by a store, it's my favorite store, Mint knows I shop there a lot. Suddenly Mint sends me a message that I'm about to blow my budget. I mean, so it's again, so it's combining these, these sources of information that I think are going to be uh, uh, really powerful and again, all of the tools that, that are being enabled now and will be enabled by 2020 will make all of this accessible to just the general layperson. You don't have a, any degree in statistics to be able to do this anymore, which means I'm out of a job. Um, so I think the last trend, which we've touched on a lot, and honestly, we could spend hours talking about it, is sort of this double-sided coin of privacy and transparency. Most people talk about privacy with respect to consumer data. So as a consumer, you want to keep your data private. And as a business, you want to try to keep your consumer's data private, although it doesn't always work that way. And then transparency is the other side of this coin. And generally, it's us usually used in the business context. So businesses decide what they want to disclose to consumers. And sometimes consumers decide what they want to reveal. Um, but where this is really relevant for 2020 is especially what's going on recently in the news, um, privacy and transparency between businesses and consumers are not that close together right now. And so in 2020, um, I think a lot of things are going to change, and those two, um, those two concepts are going to come a lot closer together. Um, and I have a couple examples that are pretty recent of B2B companies, so businesses that sell information about consumers to other businesses. Um, suddenly coming out with some kind of consumer-facing, transparent offering. So um, I'm sure everybody here has caught the Axiom uh, website where you can go on um, and see what information Axiom knows about you and is selling about you to other people. They actually encourage you to fix it, which I'm not sure you want people to know more about you. Um, you could probably fix it so that it's wrong. Um, and then even Nielsen got into the game and recently produced a consumer-facing app so that you could access their top 10 uh, data. And so again, um, transparency can also be part of a sort of business model strategy. So Chipotle is really famous for its uh, uh, sort of transparency around uh, genetically modified organisms and its food. You know, and so a consumer can make a decision about um, the value prop that a brand is offering based on the level of information and transparency. Gucci does the same thing, so you can understand where the leather came from and where your bag was produced, and you can decide to buy it if that sort of aligns with your personal objectives. So, I've rushed through everything because you've heard it all before, but what does this all mean, which I think is a really important part of this, and hopefully I've synthesized uh, a lot of what you've heard today. So, the mobile device of the future who the heck knows what it's going to be? It could be glasses. It could be a bracelet. It could be a phone. I don't really think it matters. Um, maybe you need a responsive website so that you will adapt to whatever that is. 
Um, but regardless of the mobile device of the future, we are in the middle of this incredible mobile experience journey. And what I mean by that is, I'll, I'll hopefully I'll explain it. So in 2006, 2007, when this whole thing started, the objective of most people in the mobile space was to take whatever you did in your physical space and put it on a mobile phone. You were a retailer, you put a store on your mobile phone and made an M.com. The last few years, the trend has been you use your mobile phone to try to augment your physical reality. So Uber, the, uh, the app, if you're in New York, that allows you to hail a cab, you use your phone to help you find something in the physical world. If you're in a retail environment and you scan a QR code about a product, that enhances your experience. But what we're really here to talk about is planning future strategy for, uh, for your organizations and for your clients and your businesses. And by 2020, I feel like, and I hope that you'll agree, that this uh, digital, mobile, physical world barrier is completely going to fall away. The device is going to be, uh, you know, sort of, you're going to be device agnostic. We have no idea what that's going to be. And the physical world will start interacting with consumers in a really intelligent way based on the information that it, consumers choose to provide to that part of the physical world. And so, really, um, this mobile-enabled uh, data is the center of what I believe is going to be the experience and the value exchange in 2020, which I think is a topic that a lot of other people have addressed. But I want to touch on two quick things. One is um, what I believe to be probably the greatest value for brands and for businesses is what we're calling at RGA earned data. And what that is is data that people raise their hand to provide to a brand or a business and say, this is what I want you to know about me. The brand or business takes that information, creates a cool experience that has some value, which then the consumer uses, and hopefully there's a continued value to exchange and loyalty. Um, and the other thing, for those of you that have been in the industry a while, this starts looking a lot like CRM. Um, so everything digital and mobile with this enhanced data and personally identifiable information, which is kind of where we're moving to, begins to look a lot like CRM. So if there's any old school CRM people that thought they were out of a job, I think you'll actually be back in high demand in the next few years. And since I run an analytics department, I thought I would say something about the analysis of the future. Um, when this whole digital revolution came on, we started measuring and analyzing people kind of in aggregate. So a whole group of people came in to a website through search, and we kind of followed them through to conversion. Um, as we become more and more targeted and we get more information and there's the personally identifiable information that you're willing to give to, customer, uh, to companies, that analysis of the future is getting more and more targeted and more and more specific, which starts putting us squarely back into that privacy and transparency thing again. And so I have a hypothesis that at some point, maybe the analysis becomes a little bit more general and aggregated just to make sure that that privacy is maintained between a brand and its customers. Maybe not, but it's something to consider as we are getting more and more specific about what we're analyzing um, in terms of, you know, sort of our, our, our customer. So, so sort of in close, um, you know, knowing what the future entails, I think is super important when you're setting a strategy, whether it's a mobile strategy or, an, or another type of strategy, whether, you know, you're doing it for yourself or whether you're doing it for a client or some, some other sort of engagement. And I feel like um, the trends that I talked to you about today, the real-time insight, um, I can't even remember my own trends, this is great. Uh, real-time insight, uh, hyper-local and actionable, uh, privacy and transparency, and the democratization of information will definitely be key things to think about for 2020. So as you're thinking about preparing your strategy, I definitely continue to think about those things in mind. So that's it.